Mike made the com comment about trying to get concordance on what translational research is, is. And that's, I mean, there's just such a variety uh, of stuff going on from the full beginning of T1, T2, so now we talk about T3, T4. And it's actually been a, I'll preface it by saying it's been a huge, uh, actually, growth experience for me to work with CTSI over the past five years, being sort of in my own world far at the T2 end. And I must say, it's probably the experience that I have when I listen to Jeff give his talks is probably about what you're going to experience now, Jeff, with my talk, um, which is just, but that's part of this, is it's a whole different language. It's a, you know, where I'm attacking health problems from. And, I'm, you know, I, it's all I can do to get to a worm, but much back to the actual, you know, underlying cellular intricate dynamics. So I think what it calls is all of us to sort of think, are there common commonalities and parallels and language we can use about that. So that's one of the things I'm going to try to talk about with this is sort of a framework that maybe can draw on, on a whole host of translational research to try to put some of this work we're doing on community help in perspective. So this is going to be this update on SF-HIP. Um, and the first question you may rightfully ask is, um, what is HIP? Oh, see this? Thing? All right. See, I was going to get clever, but, um, but you'll have to just ima imagine Tower of Power playing uh, in the background. So it's, what it, SF HIP is the San Francisco Health Improvement Partnerships. It's gone through a few iterations of name changes. And this is, so this is a cross-cutting initiative that we've launched into as part of the renewal grant and we really started to move towards this the year leading up to uh, this, the sixth year of our CTSI program. And, the, and this was the, this is what we put out as a challenge. And it's right, the reviewers, as I think Laura Schmidt commented uh, uh, earlier, had said that this was overambitious uh, and it probably is, but if you don't reach far, then you are suffer from poverty of uh, ambitions, which is not a good thing. So we are trying to say, can we make a measurable impact on the health of our local community and eliminate disparities through better connectivity between all the research assets we have at UCSF and the tremendous needs out there in our own local communities to actually make a difference in health? So this is a structure. Uh, we, what we've tried to do is build a collaborative network among key stakeholders in San Francisco. So it's the, the government agencies, the mayor's office, other agencies, it's um, Department of Public Health, the school district, hospitals and health systems, the hospital council, and a whole bunch of groups. And UCSF is one player, but UCSF is not frankly at the center. I mean, we are trying to articulate with this whole network of people out there working uh, on these health issues. And so I think of this when Keith Yamamoto talks about networks and transdisciplinary science and the web of connectivity, this is sort of our version at the further out on the T2 end with what I think Keith is thinking about at the sort of T1 in the beginning of translational science. But it's how do you bring disparate elements together to work collaborative, collaboratively on translational science? And at what holds this all together is a coordinating council that has representatives from each of these constituent bodies. So we have people from community-based organizations, UCSF, the health department, and so forth at the table helping to guide this project. We have selected the following eight priority areas for our work. Uh, these are based on looking carefully at what's been done in San Francisco over the past decade on needs assessment about the health problems, talking to leadership at the Department of uh, Public Health, Mitch Katz, and then Barbara Garcia, who's a new director, uh, sort of doing an assessment of what are the problems that account for a large amount of, of pre premature morbidity and mortality in this city and health disparities, and then where are our assets aligned at UCSF where we can plug in with some efforts in these particular areas, particularly thinking about moving upstream more on prevention uh, rather than just acute treatment. So the first three that we're uh, launching into, wow, that really uh, sort of disappears, doesn't it? Uh, so I'm just going to, so physical activity and healthy eating, hepatitis B and alcohol uh, related issue are the first three. The next two teed up and just getting off the ground are around violence and youth and mental health issues. And then also early uh, childhood dental care carries the number one completely preventable chronic uh, condition of children. So for each of these areas, we're uh, sort of facilitating and working with partnership working groups. And the goal for each of these groups, let's say in physical activity and nutrition, is define a target population, specify the outcomes that you want to change for that population, whether it's behavioral intermediaries or ultimate outcomes, so whether it's 
eat more f consumption of fruit in a week or it's a lowered uh, BMI or less uh, prevalence of the onset incidence of diabetes. Outcome metrics to measure your outcomes. Prioritize interventions. Look at what the evidence says. Look at what experience says from the wisdom out there in the community among people who've been working on these issues for a long time in real world settings. Figure out what's feasible to try to implement, what's scalable to be more than 25 people in an experiment about a whole population that you can affect and how's it going to be sustainable. So it just doesn't end when you have a grant and the grant ends and then the whole project ends. And then implement those interventions and evaluate them. Uh, it's not quite as linear as that when you actually get down to it. So it, it sounds good on paper, but the experience you find, it's a little bit like doing any research project. It looks good in the grant proposal, but you don't actually march through it quite in the same methodical way once you actually get to work on it. So the first project has been around alcohol. And the, the initial uh, problem that this is working around is on high users of multiple services that go by the acronym HUMS. And I don't know if you, any of you read Atul Gawande's article in the New Yorker uh, six months or so ago, but this is whole hot spotters. These are uh, individuals who consume huge amounts of resources through emergency medical services, uh, uh, ambulance transport, emergency services, social services, jail services. And so the Department of Health has been trying to get, get their hands around how to better understand this population and manage them along with a lot of community organizations and social service organizations. And one of the things they did, which is, has been to merge disparate data sets from community mental health, from health department, from emergency services, from jail services, and so forth, from the welfare system, into one integrated database with individual level data so you can identify an individual and track them across these different data sources. So, so they needed, though, expertise in how do we analyze this huge data set with very complex uh, accumulated data to make sense of it and to understand how this can inform our work. So what we have as an asset at UCSF is Laura Schmidt, who's both a sociologist and social worker, who has a lot of experience in both analytic work and understanding uh, policies in these, these programs. So Laura's worked with the Department of Public Health and other partners to analyze this. So they've done a preliminary analysis to show that there's about 400 individuals that are in this high utilizer group. Most are homeless or chronic inebriates. The top 10 individuals on this list cost the city us, our taxpayers, $2.3 million a year. Um, and about one of them die a month. So what they're working now is developing predictive models for HUMS to identify this. And it made me think of, you know, Clay's project I was thinking back on with Kaiser and others was identifying patients with TIAs that are at high risk of having strokes. Wasn't that one of the projects? So this is, it's very analogous to that in the clinical realm is how do you know which patients with risk factors are at the top of that list who need the most aggressive interventions to try to head up a cascade uh, of, of worse outcomes following. Uh, the work is then going to expand more to primary prevention around much more policy level interventions that, that are related to adoption of alcohol uh, in, in uh, populations. The next project is hepatitis B. Uh, there has been in San Francisco for several years the SF Hep B free campaign. Um, let me just look at that. Um, interesting. All right. Uh, it's funny when you look at your slide and it's not the slide you remember actually creating, but that's a whole other matter. All right. Uh, the Hepatitis B uh, campaign uh, advocates, Asian Health Week, Asian community leaders, along with the health department, have targeted outreach to the Asian immigrant community in particular. 30% of San Franciscans are of Asian ethnicity. About half are born outside the United States where there is endemic uh, hepatitis B infection, a lot of vertical transmission at or soon after birth with people then acquiring chronic hepatitis B infection. About one in 10 Asians has chronic hepatitis B. Big outreach to get Asian immigrants particularly screened and then tracked into care uh, if they test positive for chronic hepatitis B. Uh, the problem has been tremendous lack of uh, readiness on the clinical side to actually respond to people, particularly if they test positive, positive for hepatitis B. It's a complicated chronic illness. You need structured programs to get people in for hepatocellular cancer surveillance, uh, for appropriate antiviral treatment on the subgroup that's appropriate for that. And what we looked when we looked at some initial data in San Francisco, there's inappropriate screening being done. People order the wrong screening tests at, in community settings. If they're susceptible and not already infected, then people don't get their immunizations completed. And there's inadequate follow-up for people who test positive. So what we've done there is working is to assemble 
uh, a quality improvement collaborative with all these different groups in San Francisco, essentially to go at the health delivery system level and say, can we get everybody in the room and agree how we're going to tackle this citywide problem in a collaborative framework? What's remarkable about this is you just don't see these two names even on a slide next to each other. Um, uh, you know, you just don't see the Hill Physicians Group, Brown Tolan, I see Jeff Newman here, I mean, you know, CPMC and UCSF and San Francisco General and Chinese Hospital talking together. And that's what we've done. We're not too far along in this, but what we have is people in the room together talking about how are we going to come up with a common set of metrics to measure uh, appropriate practices, to track it, to feedback to each of our systems, to learn best practices from each other um, and work together. These are some of the uh, individuals from CTSI who are involved in working on this era effort, which I think is quite remarkable. Huge uh, opportunities for bioinformatics to come in here. If ever there was a place to start something like a health information exchange where you could share data across all systems, it would be something like hepatitis B screening and hepatitis B follow-up. If you want to talk about a clinical research service center, what this is going to create is unbelievable database for longitudinal research on the history of hepatitis B. I mean, you can just invent the number of research studies. Our goal is to set up a quality improvement framework, but it would have tremendous uh, synergistic opportunities with other research. Physical activity and healthy eating, these are the data on children in San Francisco uh, in terms of various indicators. Uh, you can see uh, problems, and they're particularly prominent in the Latino and African American community. Uh, I won't make you dance anymore. Uh, uh, that is the First Lady's Let's Move program. About five years ago, Mayor Newsom launched a campaign in San Francisco called Shape Up San Francisco, uh, again, to try to encourage uh, programs to support health promotion and physical activity and healthier eating. Uh, we've gotten involved uh, with, again, a lot of good stuff going out there. So it's not like we come in as CTISI and say, let's solve this problem. Let's just, you know, take this on. What we try to do is figure out how can we plug in and, and accelerate existing efforts that are going on out in their community. So one of the major events we had was last October, which was a convening of major stakeholders around physical activity, healthy eating that we did with the Shape Up people in the Department of Public Health. Uh, and so these are some of the folks. So we have, again, this is what you heard about in the video. You have Supervisor Marr there um, with, um, let me just go back up, with, um, oh, this is that tap one. You have, there's Laura Schmidt. This is Christina Goethe from the Health Department. Uh, this is um, Michael, Michael Huff from the Hospital Council. Uh, here you have some researchers here. Hillary Seligman is doing food policy. Here you have folks from Bayview Hunters Point working on programs, Larry Green from UCSF. Um, here you have some other investigators. And what this is showing is, so these one group starts to say, let's talk about regulatory policies, tax policies. This is from the New York Times uh, article that was just in the Sunday Times about taxing food as a way to actually decrease consumption of particularly sh uh, sweetened beverages. This group here with Hillary and Larry Green and community folks uh, realized they had a connection with the community groups in Bayview working on food production, community farming. Hillary has a project on WIC vouchers that can be used for farmers market produce. Well, can they be used for this group in the Bayview that's working on farming? Connect them with Hillary's K project to synergize. Down here we have folks, uh, Chris Madsen from Pediatrics, who's done a lot of research on physical activity in the schools. Uh, they're working on a project, Safe Routes to Schools, where, uh, where um, Kim has been mapping out how to work on changing uh, school assignments to emphasize local school assignment and how to then create safe crosswalks so kids can actually walk to school, can bike to school instead of having to drive to school. They have a whole bunch of projects there. This group uh, was involved on breastfeeding as a way of, again, affecting uh, weight gain and uh, infant obesity. And then again, you have folks like Larry Green, who's here at the Cancer Center in Epi and Biostats, who was on the Institute's of Medicine Committee that came out with a pro report bridging the evidence gap on obesity prevention. Tremendous resource to have at the table talking with these folks locally about how do we apply those lessons from national committees right here in our neighborhoods to strategic interventions. What we then do is try to work on a problem analysis. These are multifactorial problems with causal factors at all sorts of le levels. You have socioeconomic factors, policy, neighborhood factors, family and community policies, individual. 
And those all collide to, to create this complex problem of obesity. And you can't think if you're just going to do one little thing and just, uh, you know, a let's move, get up and do five minutes of exercise, that's going to do it. Or if you just do the community garden, you have to have a very comprehensive array of interventions with a clear conceptual model of how these are going to work together to actually move the dial on something as complicated as obesity. We've honed in on now on the Bayview Hunters Point on what's being called the heel zone. And this was through our work again through this collaboration to get a grant from the Kaiser Community Benefits Program that's gone to the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the Shape Up Program to really narrow it down to this 10,000 population size quadrant in Bayview Hunters Point uh, and to really work on then an articulated plan to make a difference on that. This was also factored into a big CDC proposal that went out as part of the community transformation grant proposals uh, that the health department took the lead on. So what we try to do is we bring the scientific evidence, the IOM reports, the um, CDC publications, as what we contribute. Gosh, I hate the tap thing. Does that, uh, am I the only one that's driven crazy by tapping on this thing, which changes it? All right. You then have community wisdom. These are food guardians. Uh, these are youth, young people in Bayview Hunters Point that are hired through some of these programs who actually go out and we have doing interviews and asset mapping to understand more what's really happening in the community. And you put together scientific evidence from rigorous research with the wisdom and the local understanding of the context to try to see how these fit together. Data has to be a key part of that work, working with bioinformatics about what are the data sets to monitor BMI, physical activity, data sets that the schools collect that are collected through various survey tools and so forth. The indispensable assets that actually really make this work are our staff, frankly. Uh, this is Ellen Goldstein, our manager, Roberto Vargas, Paula Fleischer, uh, James Rouse and Yigas. Um, I mean, all this takes people like them. These are the coordinator version that came up earlier when we were talking about clinical research services and the need for coordination. These are our key coordinators who are out there engaging with the community on a regular basis and holding kind of this, this complex coalitions together to make it work. Uh, what have we learned from some of this initial uh, advancing of the work of SF HIP? So what, I mean, it's all about what can we add that's a unique strategic value to these efforts? Again, this, the, the thing we've learned is we're not going to solve these problems as UCSF alone. And we're probably not even going to be the ones primarily driving the interventions, but we can sure help. So we can help with networking and convening. Even though you heard in the video some suspicious suspicion about UCSF and some community attitudes that are not all completely positive, there is an ability of UCSF to convene people like we did with the physical activity and nutrition planning uh, because of UCSF stature in the community. So we can do that. We can provide research evidence base. Uh, busy public health department workers, school district workers who know some of this but really can use help in people synthesizing the evidence. Theory actually helps. Um, I mean, it can annoy people who want to just get to work and move forward, but actually sometimes stepping back and putting some theoretical constructs and conceptual models can help the work take shape in a more, um, more focused way. We can help with data collection and analysis. Uh, Laura's work with HUMS being a great example. We provide human and material resources, including things like seed grants and, and the navigator services. We play a role clearly in investigation an evaluation of whatever interventions get rolled out through these types of uh, projects we're working on. And the final thing that we can do is help build local capacity, build the capacity of the health department, the school district, of community-based organizations, of neighborhoods, to be able to be more empowered to tackle and continue to solve these problems um, in partnership with us. So that's that's where we are with SF HIP. I mean, it's, it's still early. I can't come to you and have a metric for our dashboard yet that says the BMI and the heel zone has gone down, you know, 5% because uh, of this. We're early on in moving forward on the, with these projects. Uh, we're looking forward to rolling out some now in, in a more dental-focused area uh, with the oral health disparities projects uh, and someone in the more the mental health field. But it's been very exciting, tremendous learning experience, and I think is really helping us at CTSI to say we, we can at least be at the table working in partnership to try to make a difference in the most pervasive uh, problems affecting health disparities in our own communities. Thanks very much for letting me uh, share this information. Great. Thanks, Kevin. So um, wasn't this a, 
a year six post renewal project. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, the you know obviously when you when you come across something that we've you had, get no, excited about, I mean, we've had 20, 28 days to, to, yeah, yeah. to get this get this uh, done. Yeah. Then then you, you get it started early, and obviously this was something that that all of us were really excited about. So it's great to see the the progress that's been made already. So in, any uh, questions or comments? So Kevin, my mm -hmm. question relates to training people to be collaborative. Yeah. Um, what are you all doing to help communities and yeah. and, and academia and yeah. whatever yeah. understand what the process of collaboration yeah. and cooperation means and how it works and how you organize it? And yeah. so. It's. I mean, I mean that is so fundamental. It's it's related to David's comment earlier. I mean, this is, should be part of interprofessional education. I mean, I think this whole consciousness. I would say it's. It's part of how do you engage with communities, but frankly, it's fundamentally about how do you do teamwork well, which we don't teach, particularly in medicine, where it's all about you're the boss and you're the leader and you're giving or writing orders for everybody. And I'm finding the same thing is true in our clinical work, that every clinician needs to be actually better prepared to how to work in teams. There's a great, one of my favorite videos that I've seen from those TED Talks. Have people ever seen the TED? It's a guy named Sivers on First Follower. Have you ever seen this? We, gotta, we have to post it, which is about the importance of not just being that first person out there, but nothing happens unless people follow good leadership. And that that's a great thing to train people how to follow something good. So that's a lot of what we have to is unlearn how we always have to be driving everything and marching in. And I must say, I'm, that's a particular problem I have, is how you actually sit back and listen and engage and see where you can join in and plug into that. So I would think this is a skill that is essential whether it's in community engaged research or frankly how to be a good clinician or how to be a good scientist or how to work in a lab and be a collab in team science. I think this whole thing of how we train people to work in teams to understand how to follow, not just always think that they have to lead, is something we should be doing. Now we, we are doing as people talked about. I mean we're certainly teaching participatory engagement skills 101 in our K, you know, our K programs, our CTST programs, health and society, but I would think this would be the core part of interprofessional education that David mentioned. I had one comment yeah. so in, in, uh, in a Robert Woods Johnson Foundation yeah. project. There. I was involved in a Robert Wood Johnson pro project on asthma, and before we did the project, Robert Wood Johnson went to all these communities and just said, well, here's how you collaborate. I mean, basically, had this whole process about yeah. what it is, because what happened was, People would sit and people would say, "Well, I, I want to talk to you about something, or I want," and they, they would use the wrong words or say oh, no, that. I mean, it was, and it would be very touchy, and things would fall apart before you could even oh, get no, started. No. So it seems like this pre-training of yeah. how to act together. I, I, uh, so, so, a, so we don't, yeah, Ellen, we don't let anybody out. I will say, you know, Duke, uh, at least the School of Medicine, I think it's true. Duke at, requires every student to go through a whole web-based training module before they can do anything in the community to go through this. Ellen, please chime in. That navigators, because our theory is that nobody makes a cold call, nobody gets a cold call. And all of these interactions have a navigator uh, facilitating that discussion and facilitating that conversation. And then stays with that conversation until folks can go off on their own. But we have uh, everything very much um, partnered and facilitated by the navigators, which is a really different model from something that is a little bit more um, database driven, where you just find somebody's name and then make a cold call to see if they want to partner. So Kevin, um, I, I may have um, missed this, um, so that's fine. Um, in this team effort, or maybe more importantly, in this overall effort where obviously UCSF has limited resources ultimately in terms of yeah. great human beings, and forget the money. Um, where does sort of capacity building in the neighborhoods, creating a core group of, of non-professional health yeah. providers and educators so that these things can be disseminated? You know, people in the neighborhoods yeah. that are really trained mm -hmm. in a way to disseminate some of this knowledge no, and information. No, I mean, Jeff, it's, we are going in, so much with this consciousness, particularly in this budgetary environment, I don't mean just for UC, but I think for all programs, 
the failure a lot in this type of work is people say, we have this great idea. Let's train 20 community health workers and we'll get a $2 million Robert Wood Johnson grant and do that. And then they'll train them to do health, you know, nutrition and physical activity and stuff and work in schools or senior centers. And then the grant ends and those people lose their jobs because there was no thought about how does that get institutionalized. So we're going on with this thing. We want this to be sustained. We don't want this to be dependent on some grant. And, and in some ways, it's good to not have too much money right off the bat. So it's things like, how do we work with the schools to get this integrated into routine curriculum in the schools that we can support teachers doing this as part of the basic curricular problem without having to think we're going to have to hire this whole new cadre of health educators? How do we work with existing community-based organizations, those food guardians that are already out there, and there's some infrastructure? And a lot of times what you find is just there's so much parallel play going on out there. And that nobody sort of consolidated this and sort of say, how do we, again, maximize within the resources that are there the work that's being done? That's another reason for why policy is so important, because, poli you know, if, uh, taxes are, uh, are the most cost-effective intervention, because you actually make money on taxes. So that's a good thinking about or changing the structural environment. If you can do a one-time upfront capital improvement on neighborhood improvement, safe play spaces, uh, building, uh, you know, walking lanes to school and things like that. That doesn't take ongoing operating co uh, funds to sustain. So, so it's it's all about finding capacity that you can either support and then can be self-sustaining. Yeah. So I understand the self-sustaining part. Yeah. So you have to find. But I, I'll give you just one yeah. example that I'm very familiar with: is this requirement in the public schools that yeah. only a nurse yeah. can um, work with a kid who's got diabetes on yeah. their insulin yeah. injections, yeah. right? Yeah that we can't have somebody yeah. else in the school but a yeah. nurse yeah. when you have a school that has 7,000 kids yeah. in it. I mean, that's a policy yeah. issue, but it's also a training issue because yeah. these people are there. Yeah, right. And I, I just still feel that there's some pretty darn good people yeah. out there in the community yeah. that we can train to do this yeah. and not have to build a big, expensive I, program. I, I, th I think those comments are right on, Jeff. It's sort of like what we're encountering in our clinics at UCSF Medical Center, isn't it, uh, Talmadge, uh, about what a medical assistant can't, you know, our medical assistants can't give injections at, uh, at UCSF Medical Center. It takes a nurse to do that. Um, so, this, so we're tackling all these, and that's again, there again, that's policy regulatory things, and that would be, I don't know if we're working on that, but those are the kind of things that you yeah. need, you need state intervention to kind of change some of the regulatory. We, yeah, we, we would have a big P and a small P. That's the way Claire Brindis often talks about it, policy. And small, pol small P policy is uh, whether a drug is on a formulary. It's whether a nurse yeah. is required to, to be there, right? But, and so that's but, exactly the yeah. kind of, w once we can identify those issues, that's where we, we move. But see, see, and Jeff, I think, I mean, I'm really glad you raised that example. That is such a classic example of where all the wonderful research in the world hits this wall. Because you can come with a diabetes center, you know, here's, here's the best way to treat di you know, childhood diabetes, juvenile diabetes. It needs to have insulin monitored, you know, or glucose monitored and injected at school. There needs to be some support for that, particularly with younger kids. And we figured out the right algorithm for that. You know, we know the right injection schedule and the short acting, long acting, and the metabolic, you know, max optimization of, of glucose control. And then you hit this stupid thing like, but, and there's, there's this assistant there who could help with that or a teacher who'd be willing to be trained or be knowledgeable, but they can't do it because of a regulatory policy. And so I think, I mean, that's the, one of the big barriers with translational research is just these real world impediments to getting great discovery and even, I mean, those are sort of the clinical arc of it, which is about how to deliver services. And then you read the reality out there in the community, whether it's regulatory, whether it's just people aren't trained, um, and so forth. So, I mean, this, this is the classic stuff we need to tackle. And I think this is also where the power and prestige of UCSF really comes in handy. Yeah. Because when we come to Supervisor Marr or to the health department and say, you really ought to do this because there's a strong evidence base that we know about that supports it, it does help. You know, they, they do listen to us. And uh, so I, I, I... Yeah, particularly get the dean of the school of nursing to go to those conversations. Yeah, right, right, well, that's we, a, right. we have plans that's for him. That's I a, got yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go for it, David, yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, coming from New York, the, uh, I mean, just to get to this specific one and then back to the broader conversation, uh, the nurse in the schools was a nurse practitioner, and it wasn't just giving insulin you know, it was a broad range of services with referral into adolescent health clinics, so it was tied in. But it was a much broader range of services so that you could 
take care of a population of 7,000 people, many of whom didn't have uh, regular access to care. So I think there are a number of different models and at UCSF, I think we really do have to have that conversation about what are the range of possibilities and what's best for the population that's being served. Now in the broader thing, we had talked, Ken and I had talked when I first got here, uh, about some different ideas, some different models. Some of it is we're learning from the community. We bring things to the community, but it's also how are we educating the community uh, you know, for research. So for example, having basic, very simple research design, uh, what is IRB, community IRB, what does that mean for you? What are your rights as uh, citizens? Uh, sharing in the grant funding. So it is an I get funded and we come see you, but actually, uh, you know, 50 50 splits where it creates jobs for the community. Sharing about what grantsmanship is so that they understand that not every grant's going to come through. And you find people in the community that actually become pretty savvy about that. And so those kinds of things create a partnership where you're working with each other. And I think that's what becomes sustaining, because if a grant doesn't come through, it isn't like we disappeared. Everybody's managed each other's expectations. And I think that was a great thing that we were yeah. talking about. Yeah. Great. Well, we got to... We got to wrap up, but that was a great discussion. And I hate to close. Yeah, let me to and a just, close. And it's this is supposed cross cutting. So uh, again, we mentioned it's bioinformatics. We're working with Bill and others. But for everybody in CTSI, please, if there's ways to plug in, and we you, this is we'd like this to be as inclusive as possible. So it's an open invitation to everybody. Yeah, definitely. This so this effort. is is a cross cutting initiative that's supposed to cut across campus, all the CTSI programs. So please, everybody, get involved.